a couple of questions to Chris and then throw it open to the floor because I mean I was scribbling furiously throughout that. The first time I've seen that um, so it was totally fantastic, absolutely loved it. And I know Chris and uh, well, you I did have a hand in a little bit yeah, of yeah. but I really haven't seen that finished copy so I really really enjoyed it. Well, I don't even know where to start. I had so many thoughts before but then during it, you know, they all came out. Like maybe I want to start at the end. I thought I'd start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Were they just ahead of their time with the burning? Like we couldn't get it at the time, but do you think that oh, what, the what value of money? Yeah, like, yeah. First of all, did they undermine all their previous success in the burning? Yeah. And were they ahead of their time by doing that single act? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I kind of flip flop between ten different positions, which is what I've always sort of loved about the act and them. Is just that like at one point I'd have one view of it, which was it was the greatest art statement ever. And then, like six months later in the edit, I'd then have another view, which is it was just a failed stunt that completely undermined everything they did. And, you know, and it's just this kind of riddle inside of a secret, inside an enigma, you know, that phrase. And it's just you keep sort of picking away at it and you keep having sort of different views of it at different times. So I'm not answering the question at all. Yeah, really, yeah. But, no, that's why it makes but sense. But I, I would move through the different positions that I think everybody does when they think about it, when they talk about it. And, you know, that's the point, which is going to be endlessly. Yeah, discussing yeah. it and pulling it apart, so I don't, I don't want to nail my thoughts on a particular view. Okay. So going back to the beginning, when yeah. you thought about doing this film, I do remember you calling me and saying we seem to like doing this film about the hair lot. And I thought, why? Why the I do remember the burning as yeah, the yeah. most standout thing. But then, um, then when I heard that you had no access to either Bill or Jimmy, none, none so you no. couldn't use any of the music. No, they've been sued. The, you know, yeah, they're yeah, yeah. possibly going to sue you. Yeah, like, yeah. I, again, was like, why would you do this film? Like, what on earth made you think this was a good idea? Yeah, I asked myself that. I mean, it, it, I, I suppose it was because it was so difficult, probably impossible. I thought, therefore, it's something he's doing. But I, told you, I, I had it on my mind for like a number of years. That the, the, the initial suggestion for me to make this, and it wasn't my idea, it was Ian Neal, who's the executive producer, who can sadly come here tonight. It was his idea that I do this. And for all those reasons, it was therefore, well, that's why it's sort of impossible. So I, I quite, at that point, so 2009, when they first, the idea was first presented to me. And then I went to meet them. I was very lucky to get a meeting with Bill and Jimmy because my film Star Six had just come out. And that had got a huge amount of attention, a lot of press, and there was sort of links because in Star Circus we sold fake, but you've seen it, we sold fake stories to the tabloids, which is sort of slightly related to some stuff Bill and Jimmy was doing. So because of that, I got a meeting with them. And then they said, look, I'm, I don't want to burst your bubble, but you're not the first filmmaker who's come to us asking to make a documentary about us. And we say no to everyone else, we want to say no to you, but thanks very much for coming to, to talk to us. And so therefore, that seemed to be sort of the end of the road. And it wasn't then until I read the book by John Higgs, like about you know a couple of years later, and I read the Higgs book, and I was like, it did two things. One is it, is it gave me a prism and a lens to, because I didn't really get their story then, and that's probably one reason they turned me down, which is I just thought they just did all this cool stuff, and let's make a film about people doing cool stuff. And I didn't really get the discordianism, and I didn't really get the influence of Ken Campbell, all of that, the backstory of it, I didn't really get and understand. So when I read the Higgs book, it revealed all that to me and did provide any answers, but provided me maybe with a mental framework and a prism through which I could approach their story that would give it some kind of relevance and sense to an audience in today's world. And the other thing that Higgs did that inspired me was that he didn't get permission either. Higgs just wrote the book. He didn't get consent. He didn't get access. He knew he'd never get access because they don't. They're Bill and Jimmy, they don't talk about it. So I went and met Higgs, through ben, really through Ben Goldacre. It was all quite chaotic how it happened. So Ben Goldacre introduced me to Higgs. I went for a pint. And I said, well, how did you get access to it? Well, I didn't. I just wrote the fucking book. Mm -hmm. It's what they do. So that's when that spark came in of like, oh, well, maybe we could just start and we could sort of, we could sort of get on with it. And then I sort of, and then I sort of, yeah, yeah, maybe I could, maybe I could. And then, and then the other thing that really sort of gave me the impetus was my cameraman bought a drone. This is exactly, this is exactly what happened. And Chris Smith, who sadly can't be here, filmed all my stuff. And we were talking about it. And he said, look, I've got this drone. I really want to test it out with these new drone shots. And we had a few weeks where we weren't doing anything. And he said, look, what would Bill and Jimmy do? He said, well, I'll just get on with it. So we drove to Scotland. That's when you were involved. And we printed a load of fake money. And we drove to Scotland. And we said, let's just start. Let's just start doing it. Stop talking about it. Start filming something. And see sort of what happens in the momentum. Yeah. Sort of pick up and it, you know, did on that. <laughs> but, yeah. I, think, I think that is a really amazing sentiment that comes out of the film and that I got from working with you and John Hitchcock as, as well is that just 
Yeah, yeah. Kind of get the whole Discordian thing, which yeah, I yeah. But it's, it's sort of exciting to see that that is how they lived and that is yeah, yeah. the result of that. And it horrifies production people, it horrifies yeah. finances yeah, yeah, yeah. to have that sort yeah. of approach. But, but you just made the film in the same vein as the yeah. there. And you know, then you had like a total stroke of genius by coming up with the, it come, whoever, where do you get the tapes, the recording? Well, we can't go into it. too much detail about the tapes, but it did come from there. That's one thing I can say. Is one of the contributors in the film turned up with the tapes. And, and then, like, then I was just... And then it was like, thank you, yes, the gods of the Discordian gods of Because until that point, we'd probably been going about a year on and on. It wasn't full time, so no one was backing it. It was just me and Chris and you just saying, look, we've got a spare weekend, oh, let's just go and film something. Um, and that's sort of how the whole issue of production sort of stumbled along. And then one of the contributors literally did just turn up with these tapes going, do you want them? Like, yeah. um, and then I listened to them and I thought, I can do it now. And it was purely, it was only because. Um, uh, uh, like Amy had been very successful with the uh, Asked Body documentary on Amy, and uh, he'd done um, Senna, and uh, uh, Matt Whitecross had done uh, a doc on Oasis that I really like, Supersonic, where it's all audio. <coughs> so it's all audio interviews and archive. Mm. And I thought, oh, I can do it their way yeah. and pretend that's the style I really wanted to use, but it was out of desperation. It's so all I had was these audio tapes, and I was like, well, it's now. You know, as you were saying earlier, you have to wait for your time to come, and the time of that style of documentary filmmaking had come, where maybe five, ten years before it wouldn't have occurred to me to do that. But this idea of using just the audio and then letting pictures and archive and other things do the work, I thought, oh yeah, we can do this now. Yeah, but you had to work really hard with the pictures as well. Like, there were some pretty incredible reconstructions that you had to do, pushing a car off a cliff. Well, we, we didn't actually push it off, we stopped. Just. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I wanted to push it off. I really wanted to push it off. <laughs> but so we can couldn't you afford tell me about, like, the that? Well, again, there was no pull sheets, there was no insurance. I mean, come on, people tweet when I say this, but the, like, I'm doing other docs now where everything is extraordinarily controlled, especially post COVID. So, like, documentary making is really like, heavily regulated, <laughs> especially after. And they ball wins shots someone. So everyone's really kind of jumping these days. And we were just like, oh, where's it going to go off? And so we didn't have a production company. We didn't have a crew. It was just me and Chris. And you came along for some of it. Uh, and I was like, well, I'm going to Scotland. And I need to find this sound blue bird. Like, I'm going to fucking find this sound blue bird. I can't make this film and not do it with a sound blue bird. It has to be that car. I'm not going to do it. And it takes two days of Googling. And you'll find someone in Scotland with a sound blue bird. And it's really old guy. He's retired. He'd never heard of the KLF. So I sent him the Wikipedia link and said, this and if you know the story, they pushed the car to Clifford's in this sound blue bird. So will you come along? Oh, and can we spray loads of stuff over it? Don't worry, it'll wash off, it'll wash off. And he's like, yeah, I'm not doing anything this weekend. And so like, 100 quid, 100 quid comes up with this Nissan Blue Bird, and we tend to push off. Because there's the thing, if you sort of abandon the process, and you just go, this is just how it's, we're going to do it, it's actually, it's actually sort of quite simple to, to do stuff like that. If you say, right, that's the one, we need a clip, and we need that car, and we need two people who look passingly similar to the <laughs> And, and we're just going to get on with it, basically. And that sort of infused the, the whole thing. But the thing is, once I had the tapes, everything reversed. Because then I had, um, once I sort of cut together a structure, I basically had, an, all, I had a radio play. I had like a 90-minute radio play. And the structure of the whole film hadn't really changed since then. But then we just had all these gaps. But so I was like, right, there's this scene where Jimmy has just this amazing little evocative line where he says, me and Bill are in a bar, and... We're saying, I've got an idea of something I can do with the money, and I wish someone, I wish the barman had turned around and said, you can't do that, but there wasn't someone there. And I just played that line to myself over and over in my head, and I just think, what would look good for that, for that 25 seconds? So we then came to the idea, we would shoot that, and then we'd have a barman, and we'd phase between the two. So once you've got the audio there, it's actually really economical filmmaking uh, to sort of do, to, to you know, patch those things together. I should say, by the way, James here, by the way, James Rogers. So our production man is here tonight, by the way. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. After we did all the really dangerous, like, it's slightly like illegal stuff. Like, James came on once we had, like, a proper sort of financial factors on board and, and, and had to sort of put up with me for a year. So I'm saying it's all really, really simple. It's really not. James, I call it simple. James called hard work. Uh, Just as a minor thing on some of the recon, because the only bit that I was involved with was going to Jura, yeah, and, um, you know, they're famous for whiskey, and I know they're going to be famous for the place of the burning as well. Yeah. And we go to this pub, the only pub in Old Jura, pub in Jura yeah. and I thought, well, everyone's going to remember that, and everyone's going to want to talk about it. No. 
Oh my god, they, you know, we absolutely hated, hated ours, hated Yeah, 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 yeah. it's a really bad atmosphere, they? <laughs> death of being. Well, well you're probably known for the whiskey! And, and George Orwell and stuff. Oh, right, right, So right. they saw it as like, yeah, like a curse to place. They didn't like that it was done there. And, and what we hadn't kind of considered, because we were sort of London filmmakers, oh, okay, oh, yeah. yeah, we're going to go to the pub and chat to everyone, which is what we thought we'd do. We hadn't sort of, you know, in that way you do, unless you kind of go somewhere, you get a feel for it. You know, Joe's really poor, you know, and because the way that sort of funding for public services works is it's all done for head of population, and there's a like really sparse population there, and actually they were, they were, they'd had to shut the local shop, hadn't they? Well, then they got a government guard to reopen it, but they were shutting schools, people were leaving the island. The roads are in a terrible state, and here these two twats come and burn a million pounds in front of them. So that was how they saw it. They said this island really, really struggles financially to get public services, and that and that's what these two people do here. They they weren't they didn't dig it at all. To be perfectly honest, no. Claire did. We got like a couple of people yeah. finally to talk to them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we were talking earlier about a lot of guillotining of the uh, yeah, we did forge the money. Yeah, which. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. But we burned the evidence to the court. Yeah. I did have to change <laughs> yeah. the lawyer, and he said, well, that's what the prosecutor needs to do. That is destroy all the evidence. But, um, talking of being prosecuted, um, <laughs> you... <laughs> nice segment. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, go on. Uh, you know, another issue for the film, another beyond issue. not being, risk of being sued and not having the main protagonist in the film at all, was you having to go to prison. Yeah, 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 yeah. That did stall. Yeah, <laughs> slightly. But it also helped in its own way. So I don't know if anyone people know, so I made a, the star of the film I was talking about was funded through a tax investment scheme, basically <laughs> criminal. And uh, we thought, well, it's a great film, the kids love it, what are they going to do? And they did get very upset and possibly better people, and I got sent to prison and read about it all in my book, if you want. But anyway, I'm not here to plug the book. But, so I did get sent to prison, and it was really annoying. It was annoying for a number of reasons, but it was annoying because the film was going really well at that point. Like, I'd just got the tapes. That was the thing, and this is what happens in life. It's like suddenly you're on that, and then suddenly you're that. And I was like, amazing, I've got the tapes, I can finally wait the film. What, five years? Oh, okay, right. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I, you know, I went away, but then I, I spent nine months in Wandsworth, which is where Boris Becker is right now. And, uh, uh, and that's what my book's about. But anyway, then I went, and then I spent most of my time away in open prison, where sort of middle class, sort of non risk risky prisoners go, it's like shit buttons basically. And I went to a, uh, I went to an open prison which is in Spring Hill, it's one of the better ones, uh, in Spring Hill, it's called Spring Hill which is in Oxfordshire and I was going out every day to Oxford Brook to do a degree and I, as part of that process I came back into contact with my, my MacBook. So I basically started editing it properly when I was in prison uh, and it was great because you, you, from a, like it's like writing. I don't know if people try writing or editing. Your like your biggest enemy is distraction, you know, in the creative process, and you're your own worst enemy because there's always a tweet, there's always a friend saying, "Let's go to the pub," or that, you know, whatever. Life basically comes and stops you being creative, and when you're inside, that is the one sort of advantage is you just shut away from everything really. So I that's when I started going. The tapes have been. I think I digitised tapes for all the way. The tapes were digitised. Uh, and I just started going back through and listening to them and, you know, watching all, do what edit, you should do in an edit, which is just shut yourself off and watch all the material and let the material sort of speak to you and let the material tell you what the story is rather than you telling, trying to shoot all the material into your preconceived ideas. I had all this time, so I just listened and thought about it, and, you know, sort of uh, started to create the structure. And the structure hasn't really changed. And the beginning changed, the end changed a bit. But the structure of the storytelling didn't change from that, that first um, edit I did. Okay, so you met uh, Bill and Jim at the beginning, they said, forget it. Yeah. And then, and they, I mean, I remember reading in the press that, um, that Bill and Jimmy were trying to sue you when the film was coming out. Was yeah. At the end of last year, like, <coughs> that quite hectic? Or no, that quite I mean, it's, it's a mixed blessing when people threaten to sue you. People threaten to sue every film. I don't know what it is, they always threaten to sue me. And it, it, it's a mixed blessing because it's, it costs a shitload of money in legal bills and it's really frustrating and annoying, but it will kind of always help the publicity at the end because you say, oh, it's a film they don't want you to see. So um, I never thought that would sort of happen with this. So just to sort of give you a bit of context, the, the music was really important to me. Like I'd seen other people try and do things in the K-Lab, but because, as you saw, they delete their back, back catalogue, they don't allow people a permission to use it anywhere. It changed a bit now, but at the time it was like, no one can use this ever. So the idea of doing a film about the K-Lab without the K-Lab music in, for me, was an absolute non-starter. It's like, we're only going to do it if we can use the music. And I had some early discussions with uh, a, a very old friend who's also a top copyright lawyer who said, look, if you are critiquing it, you can 
use it. And I've done, so for, it, it's a copyright decision called Fair Criticism and Review, where if you are criticising something, not negatively critiquing yeah, yeah, yeah. it, so you could be saying it's good and here's why it's good, so that's a critique, um, then you can use limited sections of work without getting the copyright owner's permission. And I've done that a lot in other films. So Star Suckers, we did tons of their dealing of Live Aid and Live Aid and footage and stuff. So well, I've done it for video before. I'd never done it with music. We simply can do it with music. So we had these discussions. And, and also I knew that in my head I didn't want a film that was wall-to-wall -wall KLF music anyway because it's rave music. And rave music, is, you can't really talk over it. It's so dense and heavily produced. So I knew I'd only probably want... They only did like four tracks anyway. So I was like, we'll celebrate those four tracks and then we'll have score... So I thought, well, well I, can, I can use fair dealing. And, th and that lawyer was kind of on the case sort of throughout, really, just watching cuts and looking at what we were doing and saying, look, yeah, this is legit. So I didn't think they'd sue. <laughs> but then there, when the film, we sort of were finishing the film, we started to show it to people. We, there, it wasn't actually them, it was their music publisher. So, um, and it wasn't, so it was Warner Chapel, and Warner Chapel owns the publishing rights, which is the songwriting rights to Phil's whole catalogue, including the Carolina music. So they just started sending us very angry, threatening letters saying we reject the whole notion of fair dealing if you put us to a man. We'll see. So that, that, that went on for like about a year while we were waiting to release it. Okay, and then, and then you met Bill and Jimmy. Oh yeah, we were sending the letters back to Warner, not to them, not to Bill and Jimmy, but to Warner Chapel saying. Yeah, but, when, <laughs> but, but you actually met up with Bill and Jimmy. Yeah, so then, so like, and this was completely out of the blue. So you know how you have, you, you get your morning coffee and I always have a vape in the morning and you sit down at your desk and you look at the emails. And there's, you know, it's mainly sort of spam or, you know, gas bill you haven't paid or whatever. And literally my emails was from Bill Drummond. I was like, well, you know, because I've been working on this film for like 13 years. So like Bill Drummond was like in my head throughout and his voice was in my head. And I see he was a, he's a big part of my life because I spent so long making the film about it. Uh, and suddenly an email from him pops up out of the blue. It was a bit of a, had a bit of a funny turn. Basically saying, do you want to come and have a coffee? This was, what was it, about four months ago, a few months ago. It's just like, yeah. Um, with me and Jimmy. So I went for a coffee at an exactly the same cafe where I met them in 2009. Yeah. I think I've seen a slightly different table, but again, looking pretty much the same, looking like Bill and Jimmy, but quite sort of, a bit older and more disheveled, but they still have such presence. Actually, you forget about them. Yeah. Is they have posed them. Bill especially has this huge, has this massive commanding presence. And he sat down and said, and I sat down to him on a cup of tea, he said, yeah, got me a cup of tea, though he's eating egg and chips, he wouldn't. Uh, and I was like really sucking myself up this meeting. I thought, well, are they going to take a swing at me? Are they going to hit me with a rib? Are they going to, what, what, you know? And he said, we've seen it. First thing Bill said to me, no, first thing he said to me was congratulations. I went, oh, thanks. Because so the press had started, but we, we knew we were going to have a release and we knew it was going to come out. So you've obviously heard that. And he said, congratulations. And he said, we've seen it. And it completely fucked with my head because I was like, oh, fuck, we've seen it. So they still, they still like to mess with you. Um, and he said, yeah, we, we love it. Yeah, we love it. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was done in a way to fuck, you know, the way that they're stunt, you know, they like messing with your head in a good way. That's what they're about. So they were like, we're going to give you, going to give you both barrels of that. Basically. I wanted to ask you, being in their presence, like, do you get that? There's a quote in the film where they say it's like they're in on a joke. With yeah. You know, no one, like, totally. do you get that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it about their bond, like, yeah, having. It's it's, it's like tele there is this weird telepathic thing between the two of them, and, and you mm -hmm. certainly got that. And it was just like for a tiny moment, it's like I basically ignored their uh, uh, demands I don't make it. I'd ignored their threats and their music publisher. I went to fucking prison and I'd still made it. And I think there was, there I said myself, there was a bit of grudging respect from them that I just got on with it. And, and I said to them, I've done, I did what you do, which is ignore the rules and get on with it. And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we did that. Yeah. Um, uh, so there was, there was, and they were really interested in the film and the process and how we've got Claire Fletcher and, they thought the cop wasn't real. They were like, the cop, we must be an actor. And I was like, no, that is actually, the, I had a brilliant research. Uh, and, you know, and they were like, oh, how do you get this guy? And, yeah, I forgot about him. And, and they were like, if the real Nats and Bluebird, I was like, yeah, then fucking want to find in Scotland. You know, they were like, and then they said, oh, we've got some notes. We've got some corrections. I was like, oh, God, here we go. And Jay said, Jimmy, Jimmy said, yeah, I didn't use... I didn't use an 808 synthesizer. 808 uh, sample, I used an 809 or something. And then I was like, okay, fuck it with me now. And Phil <coughs> said I wasn't a stage manager. I was a production designer. It was a much more senior position. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that was it. And I just felt like I was part of their little bubble. I'd, like, I'd, I'd worked hard enough to get in their bubble for 25-ish minutes and then on your way. I do still feel like, a, yeah, but I think... You know, you're always a fan, right? 
I was, I was, I wasn't. I, I wouldn't say myself I was a committed to it. It's just odd seeing as I spent uh, like, life of my adult life making this film. <laughs> oh, no, I was doing other stuff as well, but on and off. No, I mean, I, I think if you're like an ardent, ardent super fan of a band, you probably shouldn't make a film about them. You can always tell when films are made by super fans of that band because they're not very good, basically. Yeah. Like Stone Roses, Shirley Meadows. <coughs> you know, it's just him walking around going on about how amazing they were. And I think they were fucked up. I think they're flawed and stuff. I just, I, you know, fundamentally, I'm a storyteller and I just thought they have the best story. Their story pisses all over any other story of any band or any art, whatever the, whoever they were. Their story rocks, and it's a perfect three-act structure, and you can dive into the backstory. It just, it just has everything, and they, and also so many musicians, they just sort of make music, and so they don't do anything interesting. Well, Bill and Jimmy did really interesting, dramatic, like furiously fascinating things, and. And I thought, well, why, therefore, someone should make a film about them. And I get waiting for someone else to do it. That was another part of me that took. So I thought, well, Adam Curtis is going to do it. Yeah. Someone will do it. As if Capaldi would do it. Do you know what I mean? I thought, someone's going to do it. But they, I think they all thought about it, or maybe some of them did, and they hit the same brick wall I did. And they went, oh, we haven't got access, well, we can't do it then. Do you know what I mean? We can't get the music rights, well, we can't do it. So it, it was more frustration that no one else really good was doing it. So I thought, well, I might as well do it, essentially. But I wouldn't say I was. Like, I was too young, I think I was just a bit too young when, you know, it's sort of 89 to 91 was their big era. And I was, what, 13 to 15, so I wasn't my big era. And then, it, like, subsequently, I got into it, but I wasn't it was not top of my playlist. Okay. Um, has anyone here got a question else? I will just keep them going. There, top, and the corner there. You're going to love this one. See, I'm going to a super fan question. Go on. <laughs> um, where was the mention of the 2K for the Millennium single? No, oh, I mean, there's lots of stuff. I mean, yeah. where was Chill Out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where's Gimpo? You know? Yes. I mean, Cardi versus Jason. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cardi yeah. versus Jason. I mean, yeah. it, I think when you're doing something like this, it, it's not like a catalogue of here's everything these people did. And it is sort of the story that has to work in a narrative form that reaches beyond, you know, Kayla Pan, though I say it, and sort of is, is so that, you know, the thing for me as well was it was like, I, I want like 20 year olds to watch this and go, oh wow, there's a different way of creating, there's a different way of doing things than the way we maybe think that things have to be done. And I wanted it sort of to reach that audience and to be inspirational to a younger generation. And so I had to be, sort of be mindful that I couldn't just go, and this, and this, and this, and this. And actually one of the earlier cuts I did, I had a brilliant editor who came and took the film on. And actually one of the earlier cuts I did was too much, and this, and this, and this, and this. And she said, no, you've got to have an emotional journey, you've got to have character arcs, and I kind of had Gimpo in, and she cut Gimpo, because he's like, well, he sort of turns up towards the end and doesn't do anything interesting other than film it, and it's like, film badly. So it's sort of, you know, things had to be, and I'm, I'm sure people will be horrified to me say this, but like things that I, I think you probably think, and other people think are really integral to the character yeah. story, didn't, you know, had, some things had to hit the cutting room floor. And also, the other thing was, is I had the tape, and it was what Bill and Jimmy talked about. And I didn't want it to be, obviously there are talking heads in it, but I want to keep them to an absolute minimum and be it Bill and Jimmy telling the story in their own words. And they didn't talk about Fuck the Millennium, and they didn't talk about Chill Out, and they didn't talk about Gimpo, and they did, do you know what I mean? So if I had this amazing line from Bill go, oh, Gimpo came along, well, and then we did Fuck the Millennium, whatever, I'd probably put it in. But it, it was, I had to keep, I wanted it to be the careless story in Bill and Jimmy's words. I don't want it to be a kind of presenter-led voiceover going, and this, and then this, and then this. So the, uh, lots of important things. Any other questions? Yep. Um, there was a quote, it was a very enjoyable film, by the way, thank you. Uh, there was a quote earlier on, I can't remember who said it, about them trying to inject so much confusion into things that people didn't know what was true. Yeah. Um, and that's something that always, you know, really attracted me to them. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed that. But in the last few years, that's kind of become the way that politics is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's now mainstream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think they had a hand in that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure they'd love it. I mean, yeah, it's culture jamming, isn't it? And a sort of, you know, put something wrong into the system and see how that wrong thing propagates in order to sort of pull the wool away from the eyes so people can see what's kind of going on with the system, which I think was what some of the Discordians and the, uh, you know, Kerry Thornleys. Uh, you know, of this world we're doing. And, you know, and lots of other people after that. This guy called Joey Skaggs, who was, like, someone who, if you just look Google Joey Skaggs, he, he, he did, like, amazing fake stories and duped so many people in terms of getting the news to write stuff that was just absolute nonsense in order to show how much media, you know, is just regurgitating 
what's fed to it rather than checking it and telling you anything interesting, basically. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, as that's the thing that always fascinated me about them, is even though they'd vanished and they did everything they could to wipe themselves from the face of the earth, the earth changed in such a way to say that actually the things they were doing back then are sort of more and more relevant and they were ahead of their time. I mean, not just with burning the money, but with the culture jamming and sort of, you know, lots of the sort of other stuff. I mean, people, someone the other day sent me a clip and there was a, they were in a club full of 20 year olds and they thought, what time is love? You know, and it's like, so that sort of style of music, it's like, rave music never really broke America until now and now they're all over it. They call it EDM. That is, they take ecstasy, they drink energy drinks. But you know, that kind of music is now finally breaking through in America sort of 30 years, 30 years later. So yeah, that thing that I loved about them is they just seem so ahead of their time on me. Hi, yeah. Um, so when you're making a film without permissions, how do you manage to get sort of source the good quality sort of archive footage for it? And um, how, how does it work in terms of crediting the people that you know, shot that footage, all the people behind the camera, because a lot of that stuff was seen for the first time on the big screen, so it's, I'm just interested in... Yeah, so uh, without getting too much, it's really boring, some of the technicalities of the, the legal side of it, but the, the, the rule of thumb is that you're using stuff legitimately under fair dealing, and you're critiquing it, you've got to credit it. And was, were, were any of the directors of that footage credited in this Yeah, film? yeah, yeah. Were they? <laughs> Uh, no, they, 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 trust me, I did it. I went through and James. Well, I'm manager. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, at the end, exactly. Yeah. You either yeah. do them on the screen or you do it at the end. So, so all the, the directors of all the promos, all of Yeah, Bill Buck, who was the. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. He's the president. Yeah, yeah. Was well, he credited? In the yeah, I, 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 we, I, we, we go back. We were all the time. Okay. This was my life. Maybe this is a yeah. yeah. I, I, li I literally had to try and find out who directed the Idolize promo, <laughs> so he could credit them. I was finding out who directed all the ABBA promos, so he could credit them. This, this, this is one of the least glamorous parts of my job is to find this stuff. But I'm a director myself, so I was like, you know, if we can find out who directs stuff, then you've got to credit it. And I think there's different rules for music, and you've got to put in the publisher and all the different composers. So I, mean, I, I could bore you the hell out of this, but some the, the real bugger was when Bill and Jimmy were ripping stuff off without using, without crediting it, which they did massively. <laughs> yeah. So I always thought it was a bit hypocritical for them to threaten to see words. like, hang on, you did this. Yeah. Um, but so they were using ABBA and Beatles samples in their music unlawfully, and we used Bill and Jimmy's tracks in ours. So we had to credit Bill and Jimmy, but we also had to sort of sub-credit <laughs> ABBA and the Beatles, and we wrote each song. I mean, it's, it, the credits were just... Nightmare when I throw it. Yeah. Bringing the nightmare back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm interested that they still had a publisher on the payroll or within their business entity. Was, yeah. Was there other parts of the business that are still sort of going on? I don't know. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in the sense on there. I, I spent for half an hour with them at a cafe, so I did sort of get to sort of probe their inner dealings. I know that what happens traditionally is musicians sign up publishers when quite early on in their career and they take like in perpetuity. So I think when Bill was, and most musicians and singer songwriters have a publisher, be it Warner Chapel or EMI or Sony or you know one of the majors. And it's like from thence on, every time they write a song, they would administer the publishing for that. And they sort of own that right to do that forever. But every time the song is played, then the publisher takes a cut and the check comes back to them. So I think it's difficult to sort of unravel that. But Bill and Jimmy own the master recording, so they own the recordings of what they, everything they made together under Kellogg Communications. Which one of the reasons they made so much money, because they were a record label, and as they as you say in the film, so they were they were able just to get. Normally, you get like five or ten percent as an artist from the sale of a CD or single. Ever. They were getting hundred percent. Um, but I think that that when we checked out even the company's house, Keller Communications wound up sort of 15 years ago, so God knows. So one of our contributors from the film would like to ask a question. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's exactly the question. So this Marco, by the way, he's in the film, <laughs> who, who I only met tonight after seven years. Can have a round of applause for Marco? <laughs> Came here, obviously, we filmed the end of the, the film here, and then Marco gave us a fantastic quote, and we were over there and we didn't get the shot. And we, we couldn't hear it properly, oh, yeah, but the sound was terrible. So we went outside, and said, Did you just say all that for us again? And then we used it, and then oh, I didn't know who he was. I was literally going to put up like wanted posters for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was just amazing. 
amazing man who gave us this quote. So anyway, yeah. sorry, didn't answer that. That was an amazing night that um, David all the money that was taken on the door was burned. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the question is, not exactly a question, but um, obviously there's loads of unusual things about the KLF, but one thing I really noticed from your film is how much um, kind of landscape and travelling across landscapes is really important, like going to Sweden, uh, Stonehenge, going up yeah, to yeah, yeah. Uh, Orkney's, um, you know, driving around Spain, um, and yeah, it's not exactly a question, but it's, no, like, it's a good observation. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and again, it kind of came from necessity. A lot, like, so much of this film comes from necessity, you wouldn't believe, and it's probably me really doing myself down as a director. It's like, why did you do it this way? Well, it was just the only way we could do it and tell the story. But it was when we were, I was just looking at these, like, acres of black on my time. I was like, oh, what are we going to see? And then we thought, oh, yeah, you know, Ford Time Lord, the car, and the car was such an integral part of them, and was their identity for a while, like the time of Dr. Natal, it's literally that was the, the thing they put forward to say, yeah, this 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 made the um, this made the track. And it was uh, I, I, an idea I had, again, get the drone out, that we could just have these shots of the car moving around. And but you know, to exemplify the fact that they were always moving, they were always changing something, you know, they were never sort of sitting still. You know, they were just getting itchy feet and you know, they, you know, Bill himself said there wasn't a day of he, him uh, working the KLF when he wasn't shunting boxes of records around the place. They were sort of perpetually pursuing that dream and pushing themselves out. I suppose that story of Bill um, when he managed back in the bunny man and followed the journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take like a rabbit. Yeah. It seemed like that kind of idea of like a ritual journey. Yeah. Really well, it's the it's, it's, it's the pilgrimage. It's, 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 it's as old as the hills, isn't it? It's the voyage of the, of the unknown. Which for me was very evocative, you know. I, I put as a filmmaker, it's a story. It's like all films are essentially a journey, you know. And so it, it was that sort of leapt out at me. I mean, at one point there were too many drone shots in. We had to sort of scale them back because it was just lots of drone shots in the car going around the place. But it, 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 it helped. And also for a film where it's like it's all very intimate and technical, and you're in a basement and you're in a studio, it was like it was a way of, you know, opening up. And I wanted it to be a cinema experience, and that kind of gave it a kind of scale. Uh, which hopefully a lot of dogs have been I really enjoyed the film, Chris. I've been a huge fan of Keller for years, and it's amazing how seeing that, you, there's still stuff you can learn about them even now, or 30 years on, so thank you very much, I really enjoyed it. Um, I guess my question is, do you think your film might create a reappraisal of the KLF in a way? Because I actually really disagree with what with James Brown, who said they'd be remembered for the guys who burnt them anyway. Mm. I really disagree with that. Point. I still mm. remember the amazing music yeah, and what yeah. they did. But do you think now there might be a bit of a critical reappraisal of them that actually people are thinking, yeah, they were they were they were ahead of their time. Yeah, they they yeah, were yeah. completely you know, look at stuff the same the stuff that Banks is doing now. Yeah, well they were yeah, doing yeah. it thirty years ago. So do you think your film might yeah, have Yeah, totally. Effect? And I think it was something we struggle with throughout. It's like you've got this elephant in the room, it's the thing they did. And I think Brown's point was to the man in the street, mm. it is the thing they're known for, I guess. Wrongly. It's like KLF, the band who burned a million quid, and it's like, you know, Higgs used that in the title of its book. God, you know, I didn't want to do it, but they've used it in the marketing of the posters and stuff. It's become sort of synonymous with them. And I think the point I'm trying to make that I agree with is that, God, there's just so much more to them than that. And actually, you sort of need to park that and go look at all this amazing creative work they did in, again, a very, very short amount of time uh, that actually speaks to today possibly more than it spoke to that time. I don't know. So, yeah, no, ab absolutely. And what I wanted the film to do that, uh, but I also had to put the money, sort of money burning in. You could not, and so it was, it was, it was a constant tussle, kind of creatively. At one point, we started the film with the money burning, and then it was like, well, no, that's that's so obvious. That's why everyone knows the full start is something no one knows they did, which is crop circles. You know? So it's like, yeah, exactly. It, I, I, I think, hopefully, yeah, people will look at them as extraordinarily serious, credible. Artists and I think as well, it was the pranks of the stunts kind of got in the way a bit because people they were always in the press saying this, you know, pop pranksters, the KLF, and I'm like, no, there's so much more profound than that to me. And if, if the film can do that and yeah, shift the dial a bit in terms of how they're seen and see them alongside, you know, Oasis or whoever, you know, people from that time, as in terms of their influence, I think is, is you know, hugely overlooked because they don't can talk about it. They, they've allowed they've allowed themselves to be overlooked.
Well, Holcomb was about the first the, the industry that they were yeah, accused of. Yeah, you know, there Any other questions? So I feel like maybe we are wrapping up. One more at that. Okay. Just something about the uh, burning of the money or, or filming burning money, mm. fake money and also faking money. Yes. Well, what, what did the lawyers say about it? As I understand it, all those things are illegal. Well, possibly. I mean, <laughs> the law is vague on it because it's all about usage, and it's for it's it's all about forging money for the use of using it for money and using it for, for tender, which of course we, we never did. And also, we did get a hoover note, which at the time was twenty years out of circulation. So you couldn't have if you'd walked in. I mean, a it was A4 paper, it was quite obviously not real money. And also, if you walk into anything with a who on note now, they would take it. It's not, it. It went out of circulation like over 20 years ago. So, I mean, well, let's call it a grey area, but we destroy the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> but, but our money that we burned here that was, real. Burned, was real. And that, that is against the law? No, it's not against the law to burn it. Oh, I thought they changed it. Film it. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I bet my lawyers had more headaches than well, I won't yeah. deny. Yeah. 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 The legality yeah. of yeah. prison is also questionable. Yeah. Great. No more questions? Okay. Oh, one more, sorry. Yeah, you go, sorry. Uh, hello, yeah, I just love to start. Um, seems like a really interesting place, and I think your portrayal of it was quite good. So I'm just wondering, like, how many people that were kind of there and in that scene did you manage to speak to in making the film? And were there any like interesting stories of things that went on there that you couldn't put in the film that you want to tell us now? Um, yeah, I mean, no, it did seem like a kind of crazy spot, and it, it was just like a kind of an absolute free fall. Now, I know talking to loads of people, I mean, like Nick Hola, who's in the film, he was obviously mixing their stuff, and Richard Jobson, who went there to, to film that spot, like, again, all these coincidences, but I've worked with Richard Jobson on three films, I've produced three films here, so I know Jobber really well, I'm the few people he's, well, he's never fell out with, so, and I've got Jobber, you know that voice at the beginning, yeah. with the things growing up, that's Jobber, so, yeah, so, um, uh, uh, I'm even angry Scotsman. Uh, so, so yeah, no, and no, lots of other people from that time, and some of them would talk to them when go on camera, or some of them would talk to them, I thought, well, they don't, they want to put your camera because you get burnt out, frankly, you know, so it just seemed like an absolutely like wild drugs then, what do you want to say, I mean, but at the same time, you know, this like massive creativity was sort of, was, 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 was pumping out of it. Um, you know, they, they seem to like completely surf that wave of like the acid house scene, but at the same time, just just be pumping, pumping out phenomenal work. So I think a lot of tunes from that time, if you listen back, so there was another project I was working on that was sort of looking at rave music as well. Most rave songs were appallingly produced. I mean, but I mean, part of the charm, you know, you know, easy good, easy good stuff. But like you listen to it now, it's like, oh God, you know, it, it just doesn't sound very well put together because they weren't. They were just people. That's the whole point of the rave scene. You could just put do it yourself in a bedroom and you, you know, use a synthesizer and stuff. But the bit of Jimmy stuff is phenomenally produced. You listen to it now, and it, it could, you know, be made with like the top recording equipment of the day. So they managed to, at the same time, have this sort of rave lifestyle. But uh, simultaneously, everything they did was phenomenally produced. And you know, the, the music videos as well. You look at them now; they're still. You know, people don't make videos like that now. They don't spend the money on them now. Those videos just definitely produced. So they, they managed to do both at the same time. It's probably why they burnt out. It's probably why they had to stop. Like, you know, because it was just absolutely everything going around the clock. That's the impression I got. Do you have a question? Yeah, so I, I've noticed that ABBA are back on tour. Well, rather they're not. <laughs> they've sampled themselves. The same they, yeah. So. <laughs> Should the candidate take credit for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm always, someone was saying, oh, maybe you talk to any of you on. I thought, no, I don't think they're going to really be involved in the film. Um, but again, I did, I saw parallel between, you know, what Apple was, you know, up to. And, um, and yeah, I said, I, 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 well, I'd, I'd love them to see it. I hope they download it. Um, I hope the lawyers don't get too upset. We sold a little bit of this one before. It's all clean. Okay, I think that is it. Oh no, one final question. Who killed the caliph? Ah. Oh, 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 we all did. We couldn't handle them. They were ahead of their time. They were consumed by the media. Oh, thank you all for coming and thank you, Chris. For thank you very much.